Chumba Wamba gained international fame in 1997 for their song Top Thumper, which had them widely regarded as a one-hit wonder that after a brief period in the spotlight fell off the face of the earth again. However, Chumba Wamba existed for 30 whole years, from 1982 to 2012, and released a total of 14 studio albums, and they also happened to be my favorite band. So I thought, why not put the hundreds of hours I've listened to Chumba Wamba to use? This is not going to be a video directly about the band. If you want to learn more about them, I can recommend watching this video by my friend Henry is human for a starter. The goal of this video is to provide a brief description of each of the 14 studio albums, so if anyone who might be interested in getting into Chumba Wamba, or anyone else who stumbled upon this video by accident who had their interest peaked by the end of it, can use this as a guide for what to check out that suits their interest. The band varied greatly in style and approach over the course of their career, so which album would be the best to start at might be different for each person. So if any of my album descriptions sound interesting to you, give them a listen. The simplified version of their development is that they started out making punk rock in the 80s, pop in the 90s and folk in the 2000s, but in reality it's more complicated than that. However, throughout the entire career they expressed a strong anarchist stance, talking about anti-capitalism, anti-fascism, feminism, LGBT rights, and also heavily invested in as well as critical of contemporary pop culture, which is a constant throughout their entire catalog. Even if I don't mention any specific themes to an album during its description, for the remainder of this video you can assume as a default that all of their music is political. Now that we established the baseline, let's start talking about their music. 1986, Pictures of Starving Children Cell Records. This is their debut studio album, however until this point they released a large number of tapes in 7 inches, most notably the 1985 EP Revolution, so starting their discography at their first album doesn't even come close to painting a complete picture of their early days. But for simplicity's sake, we gotta start somewhere. Pictures is somewhat of a concept album around the hollowness of the charity of pop stardom and the media's involvement in colonialist exploitation of the third world. Musically, despite being considered part of their punk era, there is very little of what you would associate punk music to actually sound like on this album. The production is pretty rough as you would expect from 80s punk record, and it does get loud and shouty at times, but many songs adopt a pop or folk style, and many also feature skit-like spoken word style in which the band parodies figures within the systems they are criticizing. 1987, Never Mind the Ballads. Similar to Pictures, this is also a concept album, but this time about electoral politics, which features recurring characters in its narrative. Musically, it's a clear continuation of what they did on their previous album, but a little more pointed. It is clearly a punk album, and despite having theatrical and spoken words elements to it, it's a little more recognizable in the punk rock style than its predecessor. Overall, the album has a very similar vibe to the previous album with its snarky expression of contempt for the status quo, but is musically a lot more consistent. 1988, English Rebel Songs, 1381-1914 This is where they start to really break with the expectations of being a punk band. On this album they sing traditional folk protest songs, largely a cappella, only occasionally with very minimal instrumentation. They re-recorded the album later in 2003 with two added extra songs and adapted the title to English Rebel Songs 1381 to 1984 according to the now different time span represented by the additional songs. The re-recorded version is a little cleaner in recording and performance, but aside from the two extra tracks, the listening experience between both versions is not too different. 1990 Slap in Slap they return to full instrumentation. In fact, many songs on this album contain only little lyrics and feature extended repeating instrumental sections, making the songs rather long. Many of the songs prominently feature horns on pianos, creating a lot more danceable sound than their previous albums with a strong inspiration from disco music. Many of the songs are about or inspired by specific historic events. 1992 Shh. On this album they developed their more typical pop sound of the 90s, for the first time making heavy use of synthesizers and programmed drums in addition to their regular instrumentation. 
Many of the songs are also rather drawn out, using ambient synth and extended sections with minimal instrumentations to build up an atmosphere between louder, more upbeat or shouty sections. Many of the songs are about censorship and copyright, as well as being critical of religion and experiment with the religious imagery in the compositions and performances. If you are interested in hearing a rougher but more playful version of the album, check out the unreleased Jesus H. Christ, which features earlier versions of the songs of Shh. On Jesus H. Christ, they made heavy use of many different pop songs, repurposing sections from them for their own compositions. The album was not able to be released due to them not being able to clear the samples and physically only exists in the form of bootleg copies, so the songs were reworked completely and released as Shh. 1994. Anarchy. This is their most popular album from the pre-Top Thumper days, featuring many longtime fan favorites. They further built on their previous musical efforts of synth-heavy pop music, but now the songs are a little more compact and accessible. Despite a generally upbeat and pop-oriented nature, many songs are quite aggressive and high energy in tone, with a strong beat and snarky vocal delivery. The album also features many short, almost jingle-like transitional tracks, as well as many samples recorded from TV, giving the impression of switching through channels as you listen to the album, underlining its commentary on popular culture. 1995. Swingin' with Raymond. This album is a bit of a departure from the direction they were headed. The album is made of two clearly distinct parts, the first half being the Love In It side, which features mostly sweet, acoustic folk pop songs about love and personal identity. The second half is the Hate In It side, which has louder and more aggressive instrumentation, with louder guitars, different vocal styles and harsher drums and lyrics about various more political subjects. Despite being one album, the album functions more as two separate EPs and doesn't necessarily rely on being listened to as a continuous experience. 1997. Top Thumper. This is the big one, their major label debut and the one featuring their best known song, Top Thumping. Despite Top Thumping generally being seen as a cheery, mindless party song, it has more revolutionary implications, which come through in the context of the band's catalogue or even just the rest of the album, most of which discuss explicitly political topics. The album builds on the sound that is established by its lead single and despite Top Thumping being their one single major hit, it fits well within the catalogue of the band and is clearly part of a natural progression of their style. The sound of the album is once again built heavily around synthesizers and makes much use of programmed drums in addition to guitars and horns as well as very varied vocal styles. The sound is very bright and the production makes it sound full and grand, more so than any other album by the band, but manages to still keep its dynamics. Most of the songs are also connected with different samples and short musical bits that thematically add to the topics of the songs. 2000. What you see is what you get. Their second and last major label release. After the success of the previous album, they suddenly find themselves as part of the pop culture they have been and continue to be critical of. Much of the album is ironically addressing their new environment within American pop culture. Musically, the most notable alteration is that this album is made up of lots of very short pop rock songs, giving the impression of lots of short bursts of music, never settling on one thing for too long before moving on to the next. The production of the album also makes it sound a lot slimmer than previous albums, but without lacking any of their punch. 2002. Ready Mates. Ready Mates marks the first of their two pop to folk transition records. This album takes much inspiration from folk music in its vocals and delivery, but the instrumentation is very electronics heavy, oftentimes with strong electronic beats and trance-like synthesizers. Paired with the soft, melodic vocals, that gives this album a very strange, even haunting atmosphere at times. 2004. Un. This is their second pop-to-folk transition album, and their final album as a full electric band. This one is a lot more on the folk side, with relatively light sound with the main focus on various acoustic instruments, including accordions and violins, but paired with a full drum kit and electronic elements such as vocal samples and frequent record scratches, as well as incorporating different vocal styles. 
2005, A Sing Song and a Scrap. The former eight-person band is now stripped down to just a quartet, and the remaining band has arrived in the final folk phase of their career. While many songs on this album are very minimalistic in their instrumentation, some still have a relatively full, pop-like arrangement with percussion and instrumental leads. The vocals are now entirely performed in a soft style, as the other vocalists who did more spoken word or shouty style vocals have departed from the band. 2008. The boy bands have won. And so on and so on and so on. Now upgraded from a 4 to a 5 piece, they are here establishing themselves more as a folk band. This album largely has a more minimal instrumentation than the previous and focuses more on vocal harmonies. Similarly to What You See Is What You Get 8 years prior, this album features frequent extremely short songs of under a minute with only very few lines, but sticks with the track for longer when the moment calls for it. The album also uses frequent samples from previous albums as transitionary pieces between songs, which are nice easter eggs for those who are more closely familiar with the catalogue of the band. 2010. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. On their final studio album, they continue the established folk style from the previous albums, but now again with more complex arrangements, more prominently featuring a variety of different instruments. The sound is very gentle and playful though, and serves as a nice middle ground between the minimalistic and louder folk style arrangements. This final album is again a concept album about the subject of music itself, their composers and its relation to the world, its people and the continuous political fight against fascism. And those were all the studio albums. In general, I would probably recommend the albums Anarchy, Top Thumper or What You See Is What You Get as your first albums because I think they best represent the largest part of their career, but everyone's taste is different. So if any of the other albums sounded interesting to you, this might as well be the perfect one to start for you. If the albums aren't enough for you, the band has a giant catalogue of other releases, b-sides and obscure alternative versions, so if you do some digging you can find a lot of hidden gems in their wider discography. And I can also recommend doing some digging on the history of the band itself and their members if you are interested in anarchism, political activism and hearing about extremely cool people. If you want to learn additional background information on each of their songs, I have a Tumblr blog which archives all their CD booklets, which contain lots of extra reading material. If you crave additional Chumba Wumba content, for once watch Henry's video which I mentioned at the beginning of this video, and also check out Chumbology. Chumbology is a podcast in which they go through their discography song by song and also go off on extended tangents. It's very entertaining. I myself was a guest on a recent episode. Thank you Henry for reading the script and giving me feedback, and thank you all for watching. If you have a favorite album or song, write in the comments, I'd love to hear from you.